Welcome everybody. It's so lovely to see you all here today. I'm Michelle Hyde and I'll be your MC for this morning. I'm a member of People with Disability Australia and have been for a number of years. I was also a director in 2022-23. I've got lived experience of disability, both congenital and acquired. Most of my working background has been in research, teaching and academia in the veterinary and medical sciences. My, I'm a long-term sole supporting single mother of four boys and I'm a carer as well. Outside of work, I love to write and read and cook and voice the efforts on other people because I have a very limited diet and I love to walk. I'm so pleased to be here today. I'd like to start this wonderful occasion by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. I live and work on beautiful Ngunnawal country here in Canberra. I pay my respects to the traditional custodians past and present and acknowledge their ongoing and unbroken care for land, sea and skies. I personally acknowledge my First Nations ancestors with my family coming from Gomoroi country in Western New South Wales. I pay my respects to the fierce and brave women that protected our family and brought so many back to rest together. As I live and work on Ngunnawal land, I'd also like to perform this acknowledgement in Ngunnawal language. And this is not my language, but I've been given permission to do so by traditional custodians. So, Dura Nuna Dura Nunawal. This is Ngunnawal country. Yangu Nalamanyan Dunimanyan. Today we're all meeting together on Ngunnawal country. Nunawal worry, Dua will worry, Dindi, Wanjirilin Jin Yin. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders. Thank you. I also wish to acknowledge and welcome the women and gender diverse people with lived experience of disability who have joined today's event. Welcome. Now, one of the best things about these sorts of um, gatherings is making connections. It's finding people that you might like to connect with in the future. It's finding people that can open doors for you or people that you can open doors for. So I'd like to take just a moment to connect. We're an incredibly diverse group of people, but I bet we've all got one thing in common and that's that we're really tired. Nod vigorously if you agree with the really tired bit. <laughs> Let's take a minute, just a minute for ourselves to relax and connect. So I'd like to invite you to relax in your seat, sit up straight, lift your head up to the sky, put your feet down firmly on the ground. Take a deep breath in, close your eyes if you want to, or look down, whatever suits you best. Take a deep breath in and breathe in inspiration, connection, happiness, play, mindfulness, innovation. As you breathe out, breathe out negativity and tiredness and heaviness. Breathe in again and just relax and enjoy the peace of a deep breath. When you breathe out this time, imagine the connections going out from your feet into the earth and drawing sustenance from the earth and from all the other marvellous people in our group today. Thank you. All right, so the event overview. This is Leading Change, a webinar for women and gender diverse people with disability with the topic of leadership. Today we'll be exploring the themes of leading change, breaking down barriers, and exploring what resilience, inclusion, and success looks like. Today's event and agenda is designed by, led by, and for women and gender diverse people with disability. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers here today. So our speakers include Dr. Shala Daniels Mays, Aki Ngo, Dr. Heidi Badiwi, Mariki Jonkers, and Ruth Bonser. And this event is really proudly sponsored, funded by Women New South Wales as part of New South Wales government. Today's event will run for 90 minutes and finish at 12 noon. And as I mentioned, I invite you all to connect with one another and join in today's conversation in the Zoom chat. 
The wonderful People with Disability Australia team members will be moderating the chat and can support you with any technical issues if they arise. And I want to emphasise that today's event will remain a safe and inclusive space for all participants. And we hope you'll support us in making that happen. We're about to get the conversation started with a poll that's going to appear shortly on your screen. And our poll's going to ask the question, what are you most looking forward to getting out of today's event? So while we're waiting for that to pop up or while you're considering your answer, I'd like to now hand over to the President of People with Disability, Marika Jonkers. Marika is a Paralympic swimmer, para triathlete, and founder of the charitable foundation Sporting Dreams, which helps athletes with disabilities. She also runs her own business and is a passionate advocate for the employment of people with disability. Marika will cover housekeeping before providing an introduction to People with Disability Australia and the Advancing Women Project, which this event is an initiative of. Welcome, Marika. Marika, you're on mute today. Unmute again. Coming through loud and clear. Thank you so much, Michelle, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Michelle for that introduction and setting a scene for this really important event. I'm going to start with some housekeeping tips. To access the captions, please select the closed captions button. Our Auslan interpreters will be spotlighted and should be visible on the screen with the speakers. If you require technical support today, please send your questions to technical support through the chat box, or you can do it by email to comms at pwd.org.au. We'll get that put in the chat so that you can copy and paste. If you have a cop if you have an opportunity to ask a question in the panel discussion, this will happen later. You'll be able to ask your questions through the Q&A function. It's at the bottom of your screen. If we call for audience questions, please wait until you uh, see the questions being asked for if you want to use the chat function instead of Q&A. And that way it won't get lost in between all the other messages and wonderful dynamic chat I know we're going to have today. There may be some delays throughout the meeting as we move between speakers and I ask for your patience. I would strongly like to echo my gratitude to New South Women New South Wales as part of the New South Wales government for funding today's event and allowing us come together. As the president of People with Disability Australia and a woman who lives with disability, I know just how important events like this are. They're not just for the subject matter that they cover, but it's the opportunity it gives us as women's and gender diverse people with disability to come together to feel seen and to share. Uh, to now be in a leadership role in the organisation, I know that wouldn't have happened without attending forums like this and finding wonderful mentors like people are now doing through this program. So I congratulate everyone who took the initiative to get up early this morning and block out this time in your diary to be here. It shows already you're on the way to being a leader because you're doing self-leadership. So this event is an initiative of People with Disability Australia and our Advancing Women Project. For anyone who's not familiar, People with Disability Australia, or PWDA for short, is a national peak rights advocacy and representative organisation that's not just poor people with disability, it's also led by and governed by people with a disability. So we're by disability, disabled people for disabled people. Since 1981, we've been advancing and protecting the rights, health and well-being of people with disability or who are deaf and giving us a voice of our own. We have a vision of a socially just, accessible, inclusive community in which the human rights, belonging, contribution, potential and a diversity of all people with disability are recognised, respected and celebrated with pride. 
And it's this vision that informed the development of Advancing Women Project. One year ago, we launched this project with the aim of bringing a critical mass of allies who together will create a workplace where employing, retaining and developing women and gender diverse people with disability is just business as usual. It's nothing special. And one day we don't have to have these meetings anymore. Our objective is the increase in women and the number of women and gender diverse people in leadership and decision making roles all the way across Australia. Since launching our project 12 months ago, we've spoken with hundreds of women and gender diverse people with disability. They've outlined the many barriers we face in accessing work and decision making opportunities across our lives and our careers. We heard the obstacles during the recruitment process, the fear of disclosing disability for safety reasons, concern as it would impact our employment, the lack of reasonable adjustments, a complete lack of representation leading to a lack of role models, the challenges of internalised ableism, of the self-doubt and shame, and that impacted people's ability to advance in the workplace, and the lack of mainstream leadership opportunities, meaning people had to create their own opportunities, start their own business, it's something I'm personally familiar with. Most importantly, we heard loud and clear, women and gender diverse people with disability are willing and ready to lead. We just need organizations to step up and make some changes to create a safe, accessible, inclusive work environment for us. And that's why our Advancing Women Project, which is led and designed by women and gender diverse people with disabilities, will support organizations to make those changes delivering practical and targeted suite of training, education resources, and supporting leadership development opportunities and pathways. Today, we're proud to announce we are launching a new pilot and the partner is Westpac. Westpac has been a long supporter and has a proud history of advocating for women and champion accessibility and disability and inclusion. That's why Westpac has signed on as the program's pilot partner for 12 months, seeing it as a really important ideal opportunity to lead the way, closing those gaps and elevating women with disability in leadership. I really wanna highlight something I think is amazing that the group of women within Westpac who came, who are leading this partnership are a group of women who live with disability themselves. I believe some of them are on this call. So a huge shout out and high five. That's what leadership looks like, finding ways to lift up other women living with disability and gender diverse people. So this is a beautiful partnership between PWDA and Westpac. Thank you for supporting the project Westpac and helping bring this to life. I'd also like to acknowledge the Advancing Women's Project pilot is funded under the Women's Leadership and Development Program administered by the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet's Office for Women. In closing, I want to thank everyone who has joined us for today's event. I hope it inspires you and inspires change. Not just change for us, but change led by us because you are our future and you can make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marika. Really, really important words. The stronger together bit is so vital, isn't it? So remember as well, people with disability living in Australia can join PWDA for free. Um, members of the heart of PWDA's work to uphold the human rights of people with disability. As a member, you get access to PWDA's newsletters, the events, and the um, ability to inform advocacy work and priorities. And you can join today. There'll be a link provided for you to do so. Okay, so it's my really great pleasure to go on to introduce you to our first speaker for today. And I can see from the poll we conducted earlier that many of you are looking forward to learning about leadership, a topic our first keynote speaker has a lot of experience and expertise in. Welcome, Dr. Shilar Daniels-Mays. Hi, Michelle. 
long time Shilla. no speak. <laughs> Sorry, I'll You're continue right. just a bit with an introduction. Yeah. Um, so Shala is a Gomorrah woman who's vision impaired. She holds a position of lecturer in Indigenous Studies and Deputy, Deputy Associate Dean Diversity and Inclusion Disability within the Faculty of Arts. Her research expertise includes sociology of racism, critical Indigenous studies, critical disability studies and intersectionality. Shala has an extensive history of providing leadership in universities for the government and within community organisations. She's been an advocate and an activist for disability equity for over three decades. And I must say, Shala, I keep running into people that you've mentored in all kinds of situations that I would not have necessarily expected, most definitely not just in the sciences. So thank you for your ongoing work. Welcome, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Thanks for that, Michelle. Yeah, I tend to pop up in a lot of places. Um, so in my Gomoroi language, um, Yama Birama, which is Yama sisters, um, and that would be women and gender diverse. Um, I'm coming today from the city of Nam, uh, which is in, our, in everybody's thinking Melbourne, but it is getting more and more recognition as the city of Nam. And I'm on Wurundjeri country of the Kulin Nations. But originally I came from northwest New South Wales, um, around the areas of Tamworth and Inverell. Um, I lost most of my eyesight about the age of nine um, and went into institutional care for the first seven years after that. So I finally managed, and I won't go into the long story right now, uh, to get myself expelled from an institution for what was then referred to as handicapped children. We're talking about the early 1980s. So as we all know, language has changed for people with disability as for First Nations people um, from decade to decade, if not from year to year sometimes. Um, when I was asked to do this, it's sort of like I was starting to try and think through how... I got to where I am because I think one of the most common things um, we all experience apart from tiredness as people with disability is low expectations of people around us. And um, that can be internalised to the point that we feel paralysis. We feel like we're not worthy of going forward and becoming leaders or co-designing or giving advice or advocating and so forth and so on. So we internalise that to the point that we don't do anything, okay? And my reality is this, is that, yeah, Michelle read out my biography um, there, but this is the person, me, um, who at age 16 got herself expelled from an institution because their expectations of me were that I was going to go off and make coat hangers in a sheltered workshop for a living because at the age of nine I had been diagnosed as mildly mentally retarded using the language of back then so mildly intellectually disabled and that was because I failed an IQ test that had not been modified for blindness and had not been modified for the fact that due to vision loss over the previous two to three years I hadn't been to school so I didn't have a hope of actually passing that test in any way, shape or form. And those low expectations um, sort of were like a push me, pull you system and still are in a lot of ways for decades. And I think it was only in about 2010, so we're only talking 14 years ago, where I actually figured out that I might have a brain. It took a long, long time to get to that point. Um, so. Leadership for me is about um, trying to push back against those low expectations, okay? It's about giving voice to everyday living, whether that be an Aboriginal woman, be a woman with disability, or in my case, an Aboriginal woman with disability. It's pushing back against those low expectations. It's also a question of let's think about, and I want you all just to take a moment to think about this. If someone said to you, what is leadership? It's a big question. What comes to mind 
Thing, Kay. How would you define it? And I know we can't have a discussion today, but I want you to have a think about that for just a moment. I'm going to stop talking for a couple of seconds here. If you define leadership, and you might not get words to define, but you might get a picture in your head to define. You might get like what we call a hierarchical system where we have the leader up the top or out the front um, and then everybody else is behind. You, you, that's one image, one understanding that the leader is out the front. For me, that's a very non-Aboriginal way of thinking, okay? We talk about being part of a collective or part of a system and each and every one of us in that system has skills and abilities. There's no word in, Abor in any Aboriginal language uh, for disability. Okay. okay, so just remember that. It's a strength-based. Okay. If you're born with some but difference... But if you put your glasses, you can't see anything. We okay? Apologies, I'll just mute that. Okay. So if we're born with some sort of difference, then it's about um, what is the strength of that person. I didn't get into doing a PhD because I thought I was brainy enough to do one. I got into a PhD looking at successful teaching of Aboriginal high school students because my Aboriginal community said that that's what I was to go and do. That's what they had identified in me as being the strength. And in my PhD, I made sure I had some really good elders on board to mentor me and teach me. So it's being, being part of a collective, not being out front. If you want to be out front, that's fine. If you want to be the first Prime Minister of Australia with as a woman with disability, please do that, okay? That's fine. I don't want that. I'm too tired, okay? And I'm, I'm hoping to retire in the next decade and a half. So I don't want that role, but I'm hoping that one day there will be um, someone coming forward and doing that. So don't think I'm not saying to not be out front, but choose your moments to do that, okay? It's only been in the last probably four years, five years maybe, that I've stepped forward as a leader within the space of Aboriginality and disability. And there's a lot of reasons why I hadn't come to that previously. Um, but with the pandemic, I think a lot of our priorities changed, a lot of lived experience happened, a lot of discrimination about our disabilities and about Aboriginality have happened in the last four years. So community again said to me that if you're not stepping forward to do this leadership space at university as an Aboriginal woman with disability, then who is? And I really had to take that on board, okay, and think, okay, I need to pivot here. I need to look at building a team around me that is going to enable us to give voice um, to that because it's not anywhere really in the research, okay? A little bit, not much. And if it's not in the research, then it's not in policy. And then if it's not in policy, it's not in practice. So that's the chain of events that I often think about. Um, how long have we got, Michelle? Lost track of time. You're right because we're a little bit early, so you've got a okay. few more. Just tell me to shut up when you're ready. <laughs> um, so what I would say here is, is to be looking at yourself. You turned up today, so you are leaders, as we said before, okay? You are interested in this. If you're sort of looking at becoming a you know, part of a program such as the, um, the Westpac program that's happening, that sounds really exciting. Or maybe there's a leadership role or a committee or something within an organisation. It could be a disability organisation, a community organisation. That might be something that you want to step up into, okay? And 
what I've done over the years, and it's a little bit of a scattergun kind of idea, which is why Michelle keeps on running into people that I've mentored over the years, is I put my hand up for a lot of things over the years, okay? I've done stuff within out-of-home care, so foster care, because um, I grew up in that system as well. Um, I've done a lot of work in disability, Aboriginality. Uh, I work with groups overseas as well. Um, I've worked in the HIV AIDS community. Um, so you can, and I'm doing a lot of work lately for a um, new global group that's looking at the impact of climate change on, on people with a disability. Um, and the research is showing that it's, that climate change is actually having a worse impact on disabled people. So that's something that's just starting to get recognition now. So I put my hand up for a lot of things. It doesn't mean that I know everything. And I think that's really important. I, I go and join these things quite often to learn um, and to sit there and watch and learn and listen, connect, seek out mentors, seek out those who might know things that I don't know. Um, and, and that's part of becoming a leader is to find where you want to situate yourself, not where you fit, but where you want to put yourself where you want to spend your time, your energy, your knowledge to be able to move forward something that is very special to you or important to you that you're passionate about, okay? Um, one of the things that I've done at university and if you're going into universities or corporate businesses or even, you know, some of the community agencies will allow you to do this is that there might be a committee that you're not a member of but you want to know what that committee is doing. You can always approach the chairperson and say, is it possible for me to come in and just sit and listen and see what goes on in this committee? Now, that might sound a bit odd, but you get to know the processes. You get to find out who's doing what. You might also identify a gap in what they're doing. So then you might be able to approach the chairperson and say to them, look, this is a great committee, but have you considered doing you know, digital accessibility, for example, which seems to be my great um push um, alongside accessible toilets seems to be my other legacy in life these days. Um, accessible toilets and accessible parking um, are two things that I'm always um, pushing for in any committee meeting. Okay, It doesn't matter how um, high the leaders of that group might be. Okay, So that's something that I would highly recommend to do. If you one of the things that research is showing us that I've been told recently is that a lot of um, women with disability are not going for promotion. They're not going into what they would, you know, would be considered leadership roles. They're not putting their hands up to, to join committees. And quite often it's because people will say, well, they're not going to give it to me anyway because of those low expectations that we spoke about at the beginning. Now, that might be true, okay? I'm not going to be rose-coloured glasses here. That might be true. The problem for us is that if we do not put our hands up and find our ways into leadership roles and onto committees, either directly by getting yourself known to the group as I've done through back doors or applying for positions or so forth, then the ones on that committee are the ones that do not have lived experience of issues that they need to be actually advocating for. So recently I've been working on a, a um, review of our student equity and disability services at the university because they're pretty woeful. Then it's not just my university, it's universities across Australia that can be pretty bad in this area. Some do better than others. But one of the things that was said in that is that quarterly there needs to be a meeting of senior people of the university to review 
how the changes are going. And that in itself is a great idea, it's accountability. But who are the senior leaders? How much experience do they have around equity and disability? And when we do a bit of a check on who would be on that committee, we find that they are mostly able-bodied people. So to me, there's going to be no progress really because there's no lived experience, no understanding of the urgency of some of these problems or the solutions that can be quite simple and quite cheap in some cases. Um, so then we have to put in mechanisms for training up people to be on that committee, for example, or find ways that we can uh, get the information to that table while we train people up. But the biggest problem, of course, is, as I was saying, is that if we are not putting our hands up to be on committees, to be, no, wait for, yep, yep, to be co-designing, then it's, whose voices are actually being um, heard. It's not ours. And we just have more of the same um, going all the time. So I would say to you, you know, don't be afraid. Or if you're afraid, then find a really good mentor and say, look, I want to do this, but I'm not too sure about it. What do you think? Get them on board. I have two mentors who are both women, who are both able-bodied, that have been in my life as mentors now for about seven or eight years. Um, and they have helped me figure out what I do well, figure out what I do not so well, uh, where my strengths are, uh, but also how to try and get some work-life balance. And that's really important to do that as well. So sure. I might finish up Thank with you. one question that yeah. I'll just ask people to do. On Monday morning, when you wake up, I want you to start to think one thing that you are going to do that's going to move you forward with your leadership journey based on what I'm saying here. Get past the low expectations and get past the fear. What are you going to do to step up in your leadership journey? Thank you so much, Shala. We'll obviously have to um, have some sort of forum where we can invite Shala back and have a good old chat about a whole load of issues. But some of the things that I heard today include courage, um, in a way taking that step and then finding your own support along the way. I also heard, heard about the importance of youth and something that I was thinking about yesterday. I need younger mentors. I need people that can show me how to use the technology. Uh, I need to be able to remain um, up to date with language and with understanding. So uh, that's an area that I'm really going to focus on in the future. I heard voice possibilities and expectations. Whose expectations are we actually living to? If we live to other people's expectations, where the heck are we going to go? We've got to forge our own. That's what I heard really, really strongly. And thank you so much, Shula. We'll have an opportunity to get some more insights in the panel later on. Okay, well, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Aki Nago is an internationally multi-award winning disability, gender equity advocate and activist who's deeply passionate about disability rights, intersectionality, inclusion and co-design. They are a proud, young, disabled, transgender, non-binary and LGBTIQA plus queer person of colour from a refugee and culturally diverse background. Aki is a consultant, trainer, educator, presenter, who also recently worked as the accessibility manager at Sydney Word Pride and the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, and as a senior co-design and engagement advisor at the NDIA. Aki is on many committees, boards, and advisory groups nationwide. Welcome. We really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Shirley, for that amazing insights and committees. Um, you mentioned so many committees, which I can go through. But um, firstly, of course, I would like to acknowledge 
the traditional custodians of the land on which I am on. I am in Nam, also um, the uh, recognizing um, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am on, the Kulin nations of the Rundri people. Um, I also live on a very busy road in Kensington, so I do apologize if you hear any sirens, tram bells, or anything in between, because that's what I have going on constantly. Um, and in good conscience, um, as an accessibility consultant and educator, I and trainer and a consultant, I also wanted to provide a visual descriptor of myself uh, for any blind, low vision folk or anyone that just needs a visual descriptor. So I'm an Asian person with light olive skin. I have long curled pink, very bright pink, purple and blue hair, which if anybody doesn't realize is the bisexual flag. Um, I'm wearing earrings that have the words um, fierce and be brave, um, which is made from a local Nam artist uh, called House of Dizzy. And I'm wearing a white creamy colored collared top with sausage dog prints all over them because I love sausage dogs and I have three of them one of which is sleeping right next to me. Um, so if she does pop in to say hello, I hope that you will be patient with me. Um, I'm also wearing numerous pins, pronoun pins, um, First Nations ally pins and queer pins. And I've got a variety of nose piercings um, and ear piercings and I have some makeup on. And my background is a mixture of pastel pink with my name correctly inverted, I hope, so that you can read it with my pronouns and just a bit of detail about myself. Um, firstly, I would also highlight, I would like to very much highlight that I am not a woman. I am a trans non-binary person, but I am still proud to be here today to represent feminine identifying non-binary people and femme people, because whilst I'm not a woman, and I experience gender dysphoria and everything in between, I will always be perceived as a woman in society, in the medical system, in, in every aspect of our world. And so I'll experience the sexism that women deal with, but I also experience the, the homophobia, transphobia and biophobia and all the other obias um, that people deal with and um, as a trans, gender diverse um trans person and also racism as a person of color. So um, yes, yeah, so thank you. I just also wanted to say thank you to uh, people with Disability Australia for having me um, and all your wonderful sponsors and the programs that you do. Um, as Shaylee said, like we wouldn't be here today and wouldn't have all the work today um, to to have the courage to be brave, to, to be leaders and advocate for ourselves. Um, the topic of International Women's Day this year is economic empowerment. And I guess I just wanted to share my lived experience as a child of refugees. Um, I'm a first generation Aussie. And for what for people that don't know what that means, it means that my parents were not born here. They came here after living in refugee camps, escaping the Vietnam War. And we were sent to Geraldton. Western Australia, which is where I was born. Um, and we were the only Asian people, like anywhere. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of racism. There was racism towards us and all of the First Nations people. It was not an easy place to grow up in. Um, and then I grew up in Ghana land, which is in Adelaide, and I did all my schooling in Ghana. And I moved to Melbourne or Nam for work, which I think a lot of people who want to leave Adelaide do. Um, unfortunately, due to that, we've had, I've experienced a lot of intergenerational trauma and moved out of home when I finished high school at 15. I finished year 12 at 15 and started university at 15. And I was able to leave home and escape the violence that I was experiencing, which also meant that I've lived and had bouts of homelessness uh, including living in my car, including using a bucket to go to the bathroom um, and the life that I have had a lot of that to overcome. I'm grateful for the roof I have over my head and food 
that I had on my table. And that is what we were told growing up. So sickness, health, all of that wasn't really a big deal because you're not fleeing a war. You're not on the streets begging. Um, uh, so I have lived experience of uh, life-threatening multiple complex chronic illnesses since birth. I live with chronic disabling pain, for which I'm on a lot of drugs for, prescription drugs, sorry, might highlight that. Um, and I have various disabilities. I'm physically disabled. Um, I'm also neurodivergent. I have, I'm autistic, have ADHD and CPTSD. And one of my physical disabilities is a direct result of intimate partner violence. I would also like to provide a content or trigger warning that I will be sharing those experiences um, and experiences of bigotry, homophobia, so on and so forth. Um, within all my lived experience, apologies, I should have done that when I was introducing myself. So as a first-generation Aussie and my parents uh, being refugees, living with intergenerational trauma and really just being told to put your head down, do the work, don't speak up, don't do this, don't do that, don't stand out, don't bring your delicious, delicious Asian food to school, bring a peanut butter, peanut butter sandwich to school because that's what you won't get teased for, you won't get bullied for, um, you know, like the Asian invasion growing up from Pauline Hansen was what I experienced. So that was not easy. Um, uh, and yeah, it was difficult being that third, third culture child living in between cultures of, I'm not Aussie enough because I look different, but I am Aussie because I was born and raised here. I know the culture. That's who I am. Um, and I'm proud to be Aussie, but no matter if I'm first generation or ninth generation, I'm still going to look the way that I look and be treated the way that I look, unfortunately. So on the note of economic empowerment, um, I guess, yeah, I was saying yes to a lot of opportunities, highlighting uh, my experiences and how I could contribute. Um, being born with a condition called necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a life-threatening, I guess, 50% mortality condition. I grew up having being in and out of hospital having lots and lots of surgeries and um, just being very, very ill. But once again, I had a roof over my head and food on the table, so I could not complain. Mental health doesn't matter uh, or isn't recognised in a lot of Asian cultures, unfortunately. So there was a lot to overcome and there was a lot to be shame, to felt shame of. And my parents were sh ashamed of me. Um, because I, I guess, ruined their Australian dream, you know. Um, I made their lives difficult. I made their lives tough to live. They'd escaped a war. They'd lived in refugee camps for years. They'd come by boat, X, Y, Z, and now you've got a sick child that you have to deal with. So from age 13, I started attending appointments on my own because I was their interpreter because the interpreters that they sent, like the government would send, would be northerners. And obviously there was a civil war. So why would you want a northern Vietnamese person translating for you when you're a southern Vietnamese person? Different dialects. There's lots of Vietnamese different dialects. So I was the translator. So And the accent is absolutely completely different. And in the middle of Vietnam, it sounds completely different that if I was sitting next to a person speaking that language right now, I probably wouldn't understand them. So um, the onus was put on me to translate my own health issues, um, i.e. I had a tumour at the back of my throat. And because I did, I was getting this information from my doctor I and not tr like translating it properly to my parents, they would get angry at me. And I'm like, I'm processing this myself. Like, wh why are you getting angry? At you know, like, and I was a child. So from 13, I've been pretty much on my own and moved out as a result of that. Um, and I, the only reason why I think that I wasn't diagnosed as autistic and with ADHD when I was younger was because I did well in school. 
And I only did well because of the expectations my parents put on me, because of the expectations of A is average. <laughs> um, everything before that or below that is not good enough um, because, once again, you know, we've come so far to get to Australia, to live in this wonderful country, despite the challenges of racism and bigotry and so on and so forth, we are still grateful. So there's so much disproportionate financial challenges that people with disabilities, chronically ill people face. Um, and like everyone else, we have to pay our bills, put food on the table, pay our council rates, our rent, our mortgage, so on and so forth. But in addition to that, I pay about eight to nine hundred dollars per month for my medications. I have to pay for I get a, a spinal epidural every three months, which is exactly what it sounds like, a giant needle in my spine at the level of my injury to have some pain management. That's eight hundred and fifty dollars a month. Like and so you think we are in a cost of living crisis. And we are living with some of the most expensive times and mortgages and so on and so forth. And then as a disabled, chronically ill person, we have additional costs and expenses that people don't seem to re recognise or consider. Further to that, because the world is inaccessible, it's not as easy to get around. So we are paying more for transport. We are paying more for this. We're paying more for different health-related things. And so it is... It is so challenging for people to recognise that we can't work for free. So every disabled person, any, everyone that's on here today, recognise your worth, recognise your value, recognise that you will not accept a $50 gift card for your work. You will get paid and remunerated commensurate to your qualifications, to your skill set, and lived experience is 100% in fact valid and so may you may not have qualifications but you have an entire lifetime of lived experience get paid for it and if you don't don't work with those people they are not valuing they're being tokenistic and I know I say that from a place of privilege but if I didn't hold my ground in those in that specific point I wouldn't get paid for the work that I do and now that I've valued myself in that area, I'm able to get paid for the work and the keynotes and everything that I do. Um, but yeah, I have worked for free for exposure, but learning that exposure does not pay your bills. Exposure does not pay for my medications. So it's, and it's the same if you are, you know, dealing with all of the challenges relating to being chronically ill and disabled. Also, I would like to add, um, I'm recently out of hospital, so I'm my train of thought is a bit not the best. Um, I actually have necrotic tissue um, uh, due to my Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and um, my skin is literally dying and I'm dealing with that right now and a whole bunch of antibiotics um, uh, and the lack of understanding of complex chronic illnesses. So I do apologise if I... I'm not as eloquent as I normally am. Um, but I think I would like to highlight the importance of accessibility and inclusion in employment um, and how important that is for me. So I've been working for 14 years. I know I look too young to have worked for 14 years, but I have because I finished uni quite young. Um, and I had asked for working from home like maybe once or one day a week two days a week and they always said no that is impossible what about insurance what if you hurt yourself how do we know if you're being productive no 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 and even if I had doctor's notes or you know like legitimate reasons from OT so on, they just said no and then of course the pandemic happened it shouldn't have taken a freaking pandemic for us to have our access needs met so that we could work and demonstrate that we are capable, competent humans that can do everything that we want to do, providing that our access needs are met. And that's what I learned. That was, that was, that was the biggest giveaway. It shouldn't have taken millions of people to die for that. 
and that is horrible but I had I have and had worked more in my entire life than I have because of working from home uh, because of access requirements being met because prior to the pandemic I could work a maximum of two days a week and no matter how great the salary may be 40 percent of it is not a lot Um, and when you have all these additional expenses it takes a lot out of you so access needs and access requirements just level the playing field it is not special treatment it is not special anything we are just asking for what we need to ensure that we can get what we need to do done and I think that is so important to recognize for everyone and I'm glad that because of the pandemic people are realizing that however now there's that that now like you have to come into the office an arbitrary amount of numbers for no reason, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, but push back, hold your ground, recognize what your access needs are and let people know you are able to do the work. You are able to, you know, contribute it like everyone else. It's just different. Accessibility has given me the ability to pay for the roof over my head to have my sausage dogs to give them food, to have their insurance, to have my insurance, to do all of those things, um, to not be living in my car, to 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 have that. And and honestly, it just came down to inclusion, accessibility, and meeting access needs. So I guess people can really people think that accessibility is very difficult and challenging and hard hard to do. But at the end of the day, it is not. Just communicate with us. Ask us what our needs are. Recognize what our needs are. And provide that to us. And don't have the equal opportunity. We want disabled people and LGBTIQA folk and yada, yada, yada to apply. And then when we do apply and then we get the job and you don't know what to do with us, don't do that. Have that all beforehand. Be proactive, not reactive. And include us in that so that we can be valued within ourselves and recognize that we we just need a bit of difference to be able to contribute the way that we need to. And I think I'm probably over time. So mm-hmm. I'll just highlight that um, thank you again to everyone. Um, I apologize. I've seen a few pop-ups from the chat. I apologize to anyone that is going through a challenge of inaccessibility and employees not recognizing them. Um, I hope and I genuinely hope you get there and I genuinely hope that we all get the access needs we deserve so we can contribute the best we can for our lives in this capitalist society. Um, So yes, thank you for today. Thank you so much, Aki. Before we go any further, I'd just like to acknowledge um, and say thank you for your sharing. And we can hear those burdens, you know, uh, and you're still doing fabulously. This is this is leadership. Thank you. And you're in a room full of people that can really, really understand and relate as well. And we're often not. So mm-hmm. thank you. I hear I love so many things, got me right in the feels in many respects. Um, parents that you can never satisfy, family that sometimes you have to walk away from. Uh, the lip service inclusion versus the real inclusion. Yeah, I did forget to mention I am a completely estranged from my family, so I don't have that support. I don't have that backup. You know that 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 is hard. I don't even have an emergency contact. Yeah, I yeah, I in the same situation. And very often when you're discharged from hospital, they say so. Will family be looking after you? And I go no, and they go oh shame, off you go. <laughs> exactly what happened and they sent me home like this and now they're freaking out going oh no what do we do and I'm like you can't stay in hospital forever but at the same time yeah it's it's really appalling yeah and hopefully this sort of communication and um, opportunity can help us find people to connect with as well because family is what we make hey it doesn't have to be blood it's It's the people that we connect with chosen family indeed thank you
Yeah, and I'll just reiterate, we're not we're not asking for special stuff. We're asking for the opportunity to use our skills to support ourselves. It's not that difficult. Let me support myself. Yes, exactly. I can tell you how and what I need to do that. Exactly. We'll hear more from you in the panel. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. So we're now going to go into the panel discussion section. We're going to be um, looking at exploring the themes of today's event, leading change, breaking down barriers, inclusion, resilience, and success. So joining Shala and Aki will be Dr. Heidi Badawi and Ruth Bonser. And first of all, I'll introduce Heidi for those that don't know her. So Dr. Heidi Badawi has 25 years of STEM experience, is a global leader in inclusive leadership and women's empowerment. She's a geneticist and a leadership expert. Heidi chair chairs STEAM Australia in the Women Economic Forum, holds several patents and has received numerous awards for her contributions to science and teaching innovations. She's a recipient of the Victorian government's inaugural Women's Board Leadership Program Scholarship and is a member of the AICD and the Disability Leadership Institute and Board Director, chairing the Strategic Direction Committee at PWDA. Welcome, Heidi. Ruth Bonser is also with us today. Ruth has over 20 years of IT experience and is a talented mainframe specialist with experience supporting mainframe infrastructure. They have leadership experience as the chair of Westpac's ABLE Employee Advocacy Group for Disability and Carers. They're passionate about bringing diversity to a senior role, representing LGBTIQ+, neurodiversity, gender diversity, cultural diversity, and diversity in STEM. Welcome, Ruth. So today, the structure of the panel discussion is that we'll go for approximately 30 minutes. Um, I'll start by asking a few questions. After that, we'll take some questions from our audience before we end with a final reflection from each panelist. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask, I've seen many, many pop up. You can use it, you can ask it by using the Q&A function that's available in the menu at the bottom of your screen. And of course, why we're, while we're inviting contributions, we've got a limited time today. So we may not get to everyone's questions, but the questions that we don't get to will help inform future events and communications from people with Disability Australia. So thank you for joining our panel today, Dr. Shala, Aki, Dr. Heidi and Ruth. And I'll start because I've got the position of power here at the moment. Shala, I'd like to invite you. We heard you talking and asking us to reflect on what leadership meant to us. So could I ask you to start off with why is it important to be a leader? Yeah, so for me, it's it, as I was saying before, it's important because if, if you're not at the table speaking, then you've got people speaking about you. Um, and in my experience, I've been on this planet now for 58 years, um, that speaking for us doesn't work. Um, it just perpetuates a lot of discrimination, um, a lot of prejudice. Um, so what I have found over the years of working my way into committees, um, I'm told that I'm very aggravating. Um, it's been a process of pushing um, to be heard so that then you can bring other people through. So working in Aboriginal ways, we're not talking about leadership for my personal, although it does sometimes help, but not for my personal prestige or career progression or whatever. Otherwise, there would have been much easier paths to bigger pay packets than what I've taken. Our thinking within Aboriginal communities is about what we do today is about the next seven generations. So what will this world be like for people with disability, for example, in 250 years' time? And we have to be the architects of what that's going to be like. 
but we also stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, so we, our elders of the past have been fighting the good fight for a very long time. Um, the first Aboriginal woman with disability that we have any recording of from the Europeans is a woman, um, a Sydney woman, um, and we know her, unfortunately, as Humpy Mary. So she had a, um, a, a hunchback uh, from the sketch that we have of her, but we know nothing else of her. And I think for me, she's a role model because it sort of like symbolises to me that you know, if someone hadn't have sat down and drawn a sketch of her and even entered her in the archive, we would never know about her. So to not be a leader, to not agitate, to not infiltrate, to not put our hands up is just keeping us very silent and invisible. And letting them get away with it. <laughs> I have to say that they can get away with so much because some, no one with disability has ever said it before. Mm. I hear that all the time. You know, yeah. why why do we need accessible toilets? We don't have enough people with disability to use them. We need somewhere to store our chairs in that restaurant, don't we? I wonder where those people with disability are, Shilla. I wonder where they are. I wonder where they're hiding. Um, so, yeah, and, and I mean, I have the words of my, my grandmother, who was a non-Aboriginal woman, um, in my head of, you know, you can't criticise without complimenting. So if I if something if I've been somewhere like flown with an airline or something to that effect that it's been absolutely or had a really good taxi driver, rare but true, um, if they've been absolutely exceptional in their way that they've been with me, I will track down their boss, mm -hmm. their email, their feedback, their something, and let them know about this amazing person and what it was that made them amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that gives me uh, a lot of cred in some ways. But let me tell you, then that gives me the right to also write to the same companies or different companies and say this person was absolutely horrendous. That's a form of leadership as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and just listening to you, I'm reflecting that this is why diversity is so important. This is why hearing diversity is so important. Because we don't know, we don't know. All we have to do is ask the people, what exactly. are your needs and requirements? Exactly. And it's a whole different world, isn't it, rather than assuming. So it comes back to the expectations as well. Exactly. It is about that. And, I mean, you know, when I came into the position that I had now, quite often we've been taught that we have to just be grateful for what we get and just, like, you know, that's that job offer and that's fantastic. I rejected my first two contracts of offer um, because the pay wasn't reflective of my work, okay, and it had a couple of other things in there that were not okay. Now, the reason why I knew that and, and had the ability to do that was to go to my mentors that I spoke of before and say, this is what I'm being offered. What do you think? And they said, no, 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 you're worth more than that. This, this is how you argue for that. So I went back and I said, no, this is not good enough. This is what I'm expecting. And then they came back with a second contract and I said, no, it's still not good enough. And that was really scary because I didn't have a job to fall back on. This was my job, you know, and this was going to be my income. I couldn't afford not to have a job. I don't know. I'm estranged from my family too. I don't have family to fall back on. I have a loving husband, which is fantastic. But it was really scary to go and say, no, this is not good enough. I'm worth more than what you're going to pay me and, and negotiating that pay rate up. Um, but that was done in partnership with two really good mentors. Fantastic. Thank you so much. What I might do is ask the two panellists that we haven't heard from yet and come back to you. Uh, yeah, that's fine. As well. So, um, Heidi. What would you say to women and gender diverse people with disability who aspire to be leaders but feel that these roles are out of reach due to external barriers or internal doubts? Thank you for having me, Michelle. And um, I'm overwhelmed with the stories we hear from the fabulous ladies uh, talk before me. But um, I have to say, while you've been talking and while we've been celebrating the International Women's Day with um, pride and being proud that we are not only leaders but leaders with um, super abilities and uh, a great willpower within us 
that um, the strength within us, it can um, defeat anything we are facing. Especially if you see me from a few years ago, like 10 years ago, uh, speaking about leadership, it's all about having a voice. But uh, I redefine and reshape this now with you. And it's been in my mind all the time while everyone is talking. It's not only a voice, it's a strong voice. Um, having the confidence and the self-esteem, despite I am actually, um, English is my second language. Um, I have um, a strange mix of German, Egyptian, and I'm so proud Australian. For the last 25 years living here um, in Australia, I'm so proud to say I'm so um, Australian now. Um, and this confidence from just have a voice, to have a strong voice, I didn't get it without um, being in my tribe and being among my people and the right people who really support me. I feel that I am here and I'm here clearly. No one care about my accent. No one care where I come from. No one care about um, how I look like or how I am different. So back to the diversity question here. Um, all they care about um, how I actually approach them, how I have those skills of um, uh, inclusion, how I can have a compassion to other people because it's part of the package of being uh, with disability that you really have this deep level of understanding of what people going through because you have living experience of it. Um, and I can't actually um, echo enough Sheila and Aki about it will not be for us without us. It's time to stand up in every single position of leadership um, and say, we have to have this voice, not one else advocating for us. No one else can actually speak of, um, for us because we can do it. And we can do it by building this strength. I know it's really, really, really slow and painful and a lot of loneliness in this journey moving the ball inch by inch every single day. It's not an easy um, trip and not an easy journey, but we can do it, as you said, Michelle, with reigniting ourselves by function like this one. The collective intelligence and the collective wisdom and the collective uh, energy of everyone coming here, speaking from the heart, speaking from uh, experience, speaking from pain and fear, and speaking from all the obstacles we've been uh, through, it's really, really, really super powerful. So um, having the voice, having the self-confidence, having the self-esteem, surrounding yourself with the right people, which you feel with them that you are here, and here there was a strong voice, not only voice, don't aim for normal. We've been labeled as we are not normal, unfortunately. And I would like actually to go um, and refer to a, a great guide by BWDA on 2021. And I will share the link in the chat with everyone because I found this document very, very powerful that how we would like people to um, talk to us what the appropriate language we don't be we don't want to be labeled we don't want to be um uh, treated differently we're just asking for normal treatment and it's a shame it's a shame that we want to be treated like everyone else so since we've been labeled at this area uh that we are different i would like to be labeled as a super voice if i am different i'm a superhero i'm a super able I'm a super um, motivator and I'm super igniter. So this is what I would like to be labeled as. And I think everyone will agree with me here that stop labeling, stop um, uh, pointing the fingers at us that we are different. We are different in a great way, not even a good way. So um, inclusion, um, compassion, empathy, resilience, get back to our values. Those are the true 
leadership characters, which is embedded within us, but we just rediscovering it. We relearning about them. We learning in this our journey that it's a trip and it's a root trip of um, learning new skills from the people around us, relearning things which been stereotyped for a long time and unlearning, unlearning all the negativity, unlearning all the struggles, unlearning the labeling, unlearning the language which we would like not to be treated with, unlearning that we are weak, unlearning that we are different, unlearning that we have an accent. I used to get affected by it, but that was 10 years ago. But now I feel that I have a lot of strength points within me can overcome all of this very easy. So um, thank you ev everyone for having me with you in the panel. And I hope I answered your question, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Yes, absolutely. I hear go back to your values, stick with your values and your ethics, stick with what you feel is right. Listen to your instinct, um, form teams with people. And I'd like to invite PWDA maybe to think about how do we move forward from this event and actually connect people into the future because I've heard so many voices that really, really are asking for that. Awesome. Ruth, could I ask you to perhaps tackle the question, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges in changing workplace cultures to become more inclusive of women and gender diverse people with disability? And how can organisation overcome these challenges? Just a little one. <laughs> Um, thank you for, for asking and uh, I just wanted to start by also saying thanks to everybody here for for being willing to authentically share your challenges and pain and heartbreak and I wanted to give you guys a hug but we're in different places and that would be inappropriate but I just wanted to say thanks for sharing it. You have such different stories and, and I still felt like I so deeply related to so much of what you said. So I think it speaks to what I think a lot of us have been talking about, which is that sense of community, that sense of chosen family and that sense of solidarity because we, I think, as women with disability or as gender diverse people with disability, um, we don't always see ourselves in the people in front of us who are leading, who are talking about things or even I was saying the other day being advertised to. I don't think I'm in most people's target groups when they're advertising for things. I get really random stuff sometimes and I think that the big challenge is that we, we have so many things to overcome all at once and one of them is ourselves and one of them is that cultural stuff and one of them is everybody else's biases and and comfort zones and you know I think that it's I'm excited about Westpac taking part in this events in women program because the co-design of it included a lot of the voices of people who it's for and understanding, you know, we've experienced a lot of programs that haven't worked and we know what didn't work and we need to not be doing that. We need to have the support of people who actually understand us. And, and I think for me, one of the biggest things is having people who believe in you so that you learn to believe in yourself. Because if I was to believe what I grew up with I would believe that nobody's looking for me to fulfill those leadership roles that those roles are looking for people like the ones oh, what a sweetie um like the ones who who are already doing those roles but that's not me I don't look like them I don't act like them and I don't think like them and I have to first accept that I have to get out of that box I've put myself in and I've let society put me in and and until I get out of there, I won't believe that I should go for any of those roles. And so why would anybody else believe it? I have to believe it. I have to own it. And then I have to lift up all the other people who might be 
in the same box that I was in. I have to help them get out of their box too because that's the only way we're really going to make this change. You know, the challenges are societal but we each have to change ourselves one at a time and and that's the same in the organisation. And as so many of us know, it doesn't have to be that hard. What's hard is deciding to change. Each person, each manager, each individual who applies or who advertises for these roles, recognising that there's that need to change and then and then deciding to try and change and that as soon as you know better, do better and get those people into those, you know, roles that will actually truly represent all of the people that we're leading. I mean, how can somebody lead me if they have no idea anything about me, if they're nothing like me and they don't even understand the ways that I could be different from them? Um, yeah, and I... I I think that's that's the core of what I wanted to say. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, thank you so much, Ruth. That's just summed up so much of what we've been speaking about today as well. It's so important to um, find the people that can support you, find the people that you can support. Uh, expectations. Oof, if I'd lived with the expectations that I'd grown up with, I wouldn't have got very far in life. And something that and again, harking back to Heidi, we actually have done the hard work on ourselves. We've done the really hard stuff that a lot of people in society aren't forced to do. So this is our superpower in so many ways, um, our awareness, our understanding and our compassion and leading from our values. Thank you so much, Ruth. That really, really was resonant. Whew. Okay. All right. For my final question here to our key, so many questions I could ask, but um, I'd like your opinion with what are one or two key actions you've observed organisations take that have made workplaces safer and more inclusive of women and gender diverse people with disability? And I'd also just like to um, recognise your gorgeous sausage. Perhaps you might have to hold sausage up so everyone can see that beautiful thing. So, yeah. What are, what are a couple of key actions, thank you, you've observed organisations take that have made the workplaces safer and more inclusive of women and gender diverse people with disability? Um, I'm going to firstly say that unfortunately not many places. Um, I think I've worked in about 16, 17 maybe employers in the past 14 years and a lot of it was not saying that because of ableism, sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, having to take some of them to fair work, et cetera, and that is exhausting within itself, reliving the trauma of all of that. Um, and sometimes you just don't want to do it because it's exhausting to be able to do that. However, I guess the best workplace that I've had, unfortunately, in the past 14 years is Sydney World Pride because I wasn't misgendered. I was treated and valued for who I was. Uh, my sexuality, my gender was celebrated. My expertise was celebrated. I was valued. I was paid well. I was. It was commensurate with my lived experience that they genuinely recognised and what they didn't know and understand about disability and accessibility, they came to me to ask for support for. And I was able to work with people uh, like event producers that have been producers their entire career who'd never even considered putting ramps in in these places and doing this and doing that and and literally asking oh I don't know this how do I make this place more accessible how do I do that um so I guess it's more that proactiveness that I mentioned having those policies in place not when someone who's queer or disabled or chronically ill or whatever it might be join but actually have those in place beforehand and have your staff know what that means don't just have a generic we want you know just diverse people to apply and then they get potentially the role and then they have a horrible horrible experience getting their access needs being met and um, I've actually had this experience unfortunately in 
I've worked in local, federal and state government. So I'm just going to say in government, um, highlighting that I had requested to work from home and that I also use dictation software because I've had surgery on both my wrists for carpal tunnel. Um, and that, for example, their, their IT wasn't compatible with my technology and they just could not install it. And I wasn't allowed to use my own laptop because of security reasons. So instead I was the incompetent staff member that wasn't doing my job, even though they knew these things in, but they weren't able to put them in place, even though they thought they could. And then they put that on me, which then made me feel like I was a failure, that I wasn't meeting my KPIs and so on and so forth. So do not advertise that you are accessible unless you genuinely mean it. Do not advertise that you know, uh, you know, accessibility or working with transgender diverse LGBTIQA folk uh, without actually knowing what that means do you have you know parental policies in place for uh you know uh, same-sex couples um that you know going through IVS processes do you have that uh do you have um uh how to meet transition leave if someone is going through a medical transition do you have you know all of those things I know that we're slowly starting to do menstrual leave as an example and what if you have a trans man that is going through menstruation like are you going to go, oh, no, but you're a man, like, you know what I mean? Like it's, there's so many things to consider to highlight and you need to recognise that those policies and have them in place before it becomes an issue and then you don't know what to do about it and then you make the employee feel like a burden. You make them feel like, you know, that they're asking for too much when really they're just asking for the bare minimum from that perspective. I also find that often as disabled, chronically ill folk, we have a very, very, very low bar. Like I'd be like, oh, my God, that doctor didn't misgender me. It's a miracle. And it's like it's not. It's like the bare minimum. Or like I went to, you know, a concert and I wasn't, you know, turned away from this or there was an accessible bathroom or so and we are just like so happy that that happened or this person helped me lift my wheelchair or whatever it might be and it's like that is a really low bar but we're so used to it and we're so tired of it um so yeah it's just about that if you are going to advertise your diversity uh and that you're inclusive and so on actually mean it and have the processes and policies and procedure that back that up otherwise it really is just tokenistic and co-design your policies, hire people that actually have those lived experiences and qualifications to make sure that what you're writing isn't uh, incorrect. For example, um, for an example, some government documents still don't know the difference between gender and sex. So they'll be like, this is our gender report. And they'll just say female and male. And I'm like, that's sex, not gender. And they're published on government websites. So it's like it's not written by transgender diverse LGBTIQA folk. It's written by people that don't understand policy. Same with um, non-disabled, non-chronically ill folk writing a disability action plan. You can tell when they've written it. It's really inspiration porny. Like it's just like this case study where this person had an ins you know, an accident and we've been able to do all these amazing things for them and yada, yada, and it's like, this was not written by a disabled person and it's not based on the social model of disability and it's just recognising and highlighting that we we as disabled people can recognise that when we see a policy like this and it's written in this language um, that isn't inclusive and doesn't use a social model. So, yeah, include us in all of those things that directly impact us. Fantastic. And I ask that question as a bit of a deliberate poke because we've been... We've got a long way to go. We've done so much, but we've got a long way to go. And that's a lovely focus to think about how we can move into that next space. So I've been monitoring questions from the, the floor as well. And I hope that I covered with my range of asking questions some of the things that you've been asking here. Honestly, we're coming to a very end of time. We could go on for such a long time. So I really think we need to think about ways that we can continue this conversation in this particular safe, inclusive, and incredibly powerful and empowering space. I'd just like to do a really quick whip around, 30 seconds each, um, to ask 
the, the speakers today to share the one insight or message really quickly you hope our audience takes away from today's event. And before I do that, we'll also be sharing a poll which will appear on your screen shortly. And that asks you, what insights and messages will you be taking away from today's event? So Shala, if we could come up with you really quickly, what would you like people to take away today? You're mute, sorry. Uh, that's, uh, there we go. Goodness me, take yourself off mute is my idea. Um, Monday morning, make a list of things that you're going to do to step forward to become leaders because you already are. Fabulous, thank you. Heidi. I will be quick. I have uh, seven points. Your voice is muttered. And as I said, your super voice now is muttered. The second one, you overcome your doubts. Uh, have this positive self-talk. And if you feel down, surround yourself with right people. Go on a podcast. Go on the records we have on BWDA. Or seek help from other people to do this. Um, seek support challenge um, the appellism and what's been uh, labeled next to us. You are not defined by your disability. You're defined by your strength, contribution, and the people you are surrounding yourself with. Remember this, surround yourself with the best five people you can find because it's really reshaping the rest of your life. Define your success and audit, audit all the time. Relearn, unlearn, and learn about the values and keep visiting your inner power of values it's more stronger than you can imagine it's a superpower within you advocate for inclusion when you give hope to the other people it reflects on you when you send the kindness when you talk nicely to other people it goes exactly back to you in the same single second and i can go for hours what's happening on our cells on a cellular level as a scientist i'm so biased to talk about cells and genes, your genes are changing every single time you talk with a nice way, empathy, kindness, and being kind. Um, advocate for inclusion all the time. And the most important one and the last one, believe in yourself. Self-confidence, self-esteem, self-belief, it's the main driver of your life. We are in a journey of thriving, abundance, success, and no less than that. Those are my takeaways for today. Thank, Thank you. you, Heidi. So powerful. Ruth, can we ask you just really quickly one takeaway that you'd like people to have? I'm going to be super fast and just say um, for people who are gender diverse with disability, it would be easier to stay in the shadows, but we need you to push yourself and share your voice because otherwise it's just going to be the same note from the people who don't know what they're talking about because they haven't experienced it themselves. And I'll finish that off by saying, but it's not all on us. It's not all on us. It is everybody's job to stand up for no discrimination and no bullying and no prejudice that's everyone's job and we can expect that of everyone and that is reasonable for us to expect that. Thank you so much, Ruth. Aki, can we give you the last literal word? <laughs> oh gosh, the last literal word. Um, blah, blah, be fierce in yourself. Recognise that value. Uh, sorry, second one, you are not alone. There's a community here, like right here, but also uh, everywhere. I did read in the comments, it is a privilege to say no to like contracts and work and so on, because, you know, we need to pay for things. Um, but recognize that if you can't advocate for yourself in the moment, ask someone within the community that has capacity, ask them, hi, you know, like if they're offering, you know, do you have the capacity to help me right now? I need an advocate in the workplace. And there will be people that say yes and have that energy and that support. So you are not alone in your experience. And there will and are people and organisations that will support you and know that you are not alone in all of these experiences, no matter how hard and difficult they might be. Fantastic. What a brilliant way to wrap up because we're not alone. We've seen today that we've had been able to create this incredible space, this really, really brilliant space. And I'd like to say enormous thank you to everybody who's joined. I'd like to say thank you to PWDA for organising this. Uh, thank you for those that sponsored it. 
Remember, you can join PWDA um, if you need support. There's been su some support mechanisms linked in the chats as well. Whew, what an energy. Everybody go forth and continue being the amazing people that you are. Thank you so much to everybody that's been involved today. Lots of love.